Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Access Lead, Why Lead? This presentation comes to you from the Office of Accessibility and VSA at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. I am Kate Lichter, and I will be your moderator. Before we get going, I'd like to take a brief moment and introduce you to some of the Zoom platform features. Broadcast messages from the Kennedy Center team, such as links for the stream text, appear in the chat box, which you can select from the control panel along the bottom of your window. If you need to leave the meeting early, you can leave it by clicking on the Leave Meeting button in the lower right corner. A recording of this presentation will be available afterwards, but for privacy, we will not record the Q&A. The built-in audio output is your computer's internal speakers. You may also use your phone to call in. If you get disconnected or have trouble hearing the presenters, make sure you have clicked the join audio button. Please remember that if you use your phone to call in, you should mute your computer speakers. You can submit comments, questions, or answers to questions using the chat box, which you can select from the bottom panel. I will monitor the chat throughout the presentation. You can adjust your view by selecting view options in the top panel. You may also expand your view to a full screen. Today's presentation will be captioned and signed by an ASL interpreter. To view the captions within Zoom, please click the CC button on the bottom panel. To view captions in an external browser window, please click on the stream text link in the chat. In order to pin the interpreter's video, click on the ellipses at the top right corner of the video and choose the pin video option. At various points during today's presentation, there will be opportunities to ask questions of the panelists. During this time, please type your question into the chat box or raise your hand if you'd like to voice your question. We will send out a follow-up email with a link to the recording of today's presentation and a copy of the Q&A transcript. The next access lead session is intersectionality and cultural access. What should cultural organizations be thinking about? This will take place on May, Thursday, May 12th from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. If you are active on social media, I invite you to connect with us using hashtag KC Lead. On Facebook, we are VSA International. And on Twitter and Instagram, we are at Access Lead. We would love to engage with you. And with that, I will hand it over to Charles. Wonderful. And thank you so much, Kate. And greetings to everyone who has come into this space to share this time with us today. And a, a really a, a wonderful acknowledgement to uh, my fellow panelists in the room. Uh, I know we have a robust topic and a uh, tight hour. So I'm going to really just jump right in and ask people to introduce themselves with a little bit of a description and an answer to the question, uh, when was the, um, what do you love about LEAD? That's the question. Let's start with love. So uh, I'll model this. Uh, my name is Charles Baldwin. I am uh, the access coordinator at the UP initiative at the Mass Cultural Council. I'm an older white fellow with beard, glasses, and a mohawk. And today I'm wearing a blue sweatshirt and I'm calling in from my studio in Somerville. Uh, as a reminder, uh, for anyone who is speaking, we do ask that you start with identifying yourself. Uh, so that's description, identify self, and then what do you love about LEAD? And I will say what I do love about LEAD are the wonderful colleagues that I get to work with sometimes and hopefully uh, robustly in August. Um, Jamie, why don't we go to you uh, since you are in North Carolina, in Raleigh, waiting for us all. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, everyone. My name is Jamie Katzcourt. I am the program director for a roots music organization called Pinecone that is based in Raleigh, North Carolina. And we're very excited that LEAD is coming to Raleigh finally this coming summer. And my favorite part about LEAD is 
how welcoming everyone is, no matter what information you already do or don't know about accessibility. I know I came in very green and everyone was very generous with their time and their knowledge and their willingness to share what they knew. All right, and thank you, Annie. Welcome to the space. Thank you, Charles, and thanks everybody. Um, my name is Annie Least. I work at the Museum of Modern Art as an associate educator in community and access programs. And um, I'm a middle-aged white woman with sort of wavy reddish hair that is currently being somewhat held off my face using a pair of black headphones. And I'm wearing sort of a, a dull ochre, yellow ochre colored dress and a black sweater. And I'm coming to you from my very messy cubicle at MoMA, um, hence the blurring of the background. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And what I love about LEAD is I have done a number of different jobs uh, since I've been in the cultural accessibility field, but LEAD has always been my one constant. It's my touchstone. It's where I go to sort of learn the current practices and connect with you know, friends that I have made in the conference that I, I often don't necessarily get to see in person at any other time of year. So again, coming back to what uh, Charles and Jamie have said that it's the people that really make the difference. Thank you, Annie. And, and, and Tina, representing the West Coast. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tina Childress. I live in Illinois, south of the state of Chicago, and I'm watching the skies because we're under tornado watch. And I feel really honored to be part of this panel. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a middle-aged Filipina female with brown skin, brown eyes, wearing colorful half-room glasses, and I have shoulder length and black hair streaked with gray. Um, I'm wearing a black top with white polka dots, which I'm looking at my image on the camera and I realize I look like a Cullen from Twilight because I'm kind of shimmering here. I don't know what's going on. Um, I, <laughs> there's a bedroom set behind me. Um, I am also a late deafened adult and I use bilateral cochlear implants to hear. Um, I use spoken language as well as ASL, depending on the situation that I'm in. Um, I, I mainly work as an audiologist in the school setting, but I've realized over the pandemic and also just over the years that I've been using online resources and social media to kind of advocate and create more resources. And what I love about LEAD, so this will be my third year coming to LEAD, so I feel a little bit like a newbie. And what I love is I'm learning stuff. I am learning so much stuff. And, you know, my life um, tends to revolve around like people that are deaf or hard of hearing. And I really appreciated all the exposure to all the different kinds of disabilities. And I think it's made me a better advocate when I think about universal design. So I appreciate the knowledge as well as that networking and man, cultural arts. This is, this is, these are my people. So I'm really excited to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. And this is Charles again. And uh, I misidentified. I thought you were on the West Coast. So shout out to Illinois. But I know that we have people who are in the space with us today from all across the nation, because that is certainly one of the draws of LEAD, centralizing this information. And when I think about the words that, the, that we've chosen to describe what we love about LEAD, that it's collegial, that it's generous, it's a touchstone, and that it continues and enhances our learning and our advocacy. So as we move into this, this first question really, which is to engage us in conversation and perhaps get our audience uh, thinking about questions that they would like to submit. Thinking back to the first time you came to LEAD, uh, that first time which, may have been for some longer than uh, shorter ago, but um, can you share that initial impact that the conference had on you uh, after that first, first time convening? And you can jump right in. Yes, Tina. So like I mentioned, my first lead was about three years ago. 
And I was really fortunate in that I came with someone who was already familiar with leads. So she's someone that kind of showed me the ropes, introduced me to people, but I don't want to discourage you. I, it was, I think that was a nice transition, but if you are going for the first time and you don't know anybody, understand that the people at LEAD are some of the most welcoming people that you can find. And so I find that, you know, when you, you go to conferences and you're like, okay, I learned some stuff, it was okay. And then you find those conferences where you're like, I wanna go every year because it's awesome. And I'm a conference junkie. I go to all kinds of things. And I will say that LEAD is definitely one of my top five. Um, and so, um, you know, we have the, the listserv where you can ask questions even before you come. So if you are, you know, worrying about logistics and stuff like that, um, that's a great place to ask questions as well as with social media. And for me personally, the other thing that I experienced for the first time that I have not before was that I had accessibility with interpreters that followed me as opposed to like the organizer saying, oh, this session has an interpreter, you have to go there. You know, these interpreters shadowed me um, and let me change my mind at the last minute if I needed to. And when it comes to accessibility, these are people that get it. You know, you don't have to worry about people saying, oh, never mind, or, you know, using bad communication practices. People are always willing to describe things for you if you're, you know, if you have blind, low vision. I mean, accessibility is what this is all about. So if you're a person with accessibility needs, um, know that they will also be accommodated, you know, to the best of their ability, and you don't have to fight for it. You know, that's the thing also is that you don't have to fight for it. So as as an attendee, I found it very accessible. That's so great that the conference itself is modeling the kind of work that each of us do our, in our own uh, districts, but also that we're trying to encourage uh, others to uh, embrace and amplify. What about your first visit, Jamie? Sure, uh, this is Jamie again. And my first time at LEAD was in DC probably five or six years ago now. Um, and I was also fortunate, like Tina, I actually attended with a group from Raleigh. I was part of the founding Universal Access in the Arts group that came thanks to funding from the Office of Raleigh Arts. Um, and I think for me, like I said, I came in very green. I did not really know much about accessibility at all. And so, I will say it was a little bit overwhelming at first just to find my way around, but as folks have already said, people were so gracious and generous and willing to help point me in the right directions and help me find those sessions and those people to talk to whose work would be related to the work I was doing and trying to do and trying to improve for my organization. So it and from there, I just, I never looked back. I knew I wanted to keep attending and keep learning and keep getting to see and visit new friends and old friends and learn from folks who have been doing this work and are continuing to do this work and try new things and continue pushing each other to keep doing better and as we learn more, so. Thank you. And Annie. You're up. What, what, do you remember? What was it like your first time? I love how you were about to ask me if I remember my first time, Charles. So <laughs> it was it was a while. I, I haven't been going to lead for the entire time it's existed, although there are some people on this on this uh, call who have been. But my first lead was quite a while ago in 2011. So um, I've been to probably nine of them, maybe 10 of them. Uh, it, it, the math gets fuzzy with the with the changes in COVID. But um, in the years that we had to skip, unfortunately. But so 2011 in Louisville, Kentucky, um, I also was brand new to this field. And I was also very fortunate to actually attend LEAD with, with Hannah Goodwin. I was living in Boston at the time and I was um, volunteering at the Museum of Fine Arts. I came to the field of cultural accessibility fairly late in my life, like in a formal way, um, you know, but I, 
also just had my own lived experience as being a, a person with a disability. I am, I'm, I have extremely low vision and I also am a lover of the arts and of museums and uh, sort of found this new potential direction for what I wanted to do with my career. And uh, Hannah said, you know what you need to do? You need to go to LEAD because you're gonna learn so much and you're gonna meet so many people and you're gonna see sort of the power of, of this field that we're in. And she was 100% right. My very first experience there was, um, I, 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 I jumped right in. My very first experience was a like a two half day capacity building workshop on uh, the ADA and you would think that would be a little overwhelming, but the, the folks who taught it were so amazing. And it's when I really learned that ADA compliance is actually a fundamentally creative and puzzle solving endeavor. And it's actually really, really fun. Um, and that kind of set the stage for a lot of what I kept learning at LEAD. And it was smaller when I was there, um, but it definitely sort of has grown over the past, several years but there's still that sort of generosity i think the other thing that struck me you know i i definitely second the fact that if accessibility is something that you need it's something that sort of naturally fundamentally happens you know i i hate buffets as a person who is blind uh and you know i would wander through the buffets and random people strangers the next person in line or even the person behind the counter at the buffet would help me figure out what was in front of me and that's something i've never experienced before um and the other thing that i want to flag is that again with the generosity you know people at lead will not only it's a self-selecting group of people who really want this field to grow and be better and so it's a conference where it's not just people bragging about this is what I have done and this is how wonderful my program is. I mean, you, you know, you get to see a lot of wonderful achievements that people have, but people also talk together about challenges that they've had. And they also give a lot of hands-on opportunities for you to learn in ways other than just sitting and listening to people lecture. And so those are all things that I remember from my first, uh, first couple leads as well. And they were, they're, they're make they, that's what makes it the conference that even if my whoever I'm working for at the moment will not pay for it I will take vacation time and use my own money to come to this conference because it's that worth it to me so Anna you bring up that that uh, a really great point and and something that I know that uh, smaller organizations uh, we all know capacity has shifted so much over the last couple of years but that idea of making the investment to get to lead uh, how do you convince the boss or the council or the board of its importance? Um, and I think this is something that we all certainly uh, have had to run up against. I have, uh, I'm a huge fan of LEAD. I was sent early on. It felt like a puzzle piece fell into place when I recognized the ADA as a basic civil rights legislature. It just was like, oh, right, humans. And since then, because of my work at the council, I've been able to start a grant program sending people to lead because I really believe in its importance, but not everyone has that as a resource. So what's outside of it's the right thing to do? Ideas on this. Annie, you take vacation and spend your own money. I, well, and when I have done that have been situations where I have worked at, uh, at organizations that don't typically fund going to any conference, much less, uh, much less lead. So I don't mean for that to be sort of an example. Although one of the nice things about lead is as conferences go, they make every effort to make it as affordable as possible for people. So um, I do wanna sort of applaud that you know they don't they, they they select cities based on where they can find reasonable places to stay and there are financial aid programs built in which i just i think is really really wonderful because they want to make it accessible in all those layers of what accessible means to everybody so i think that's worth kind of calling out i would also say that um in terms of persuasion you know a lot of institutions are really thinking about the buzzwords diversity, equity, inclusion, access these days. And I think often disability gets 
occasionally left out of that conversation. And I think that there's a really strong argument um, for disability impacting so many different people and uh, be, being a really kind of fundamental part of identity and part of human experience that it really should be sort of viewed as an important aspect of the DEAI or DEIA or IDEA or whatever your organization calls it, that conversation. Um, so LEAD in many ways is really uniquely suited to focus on arts and cultural institutions who are thinking about disability. I can't think of another conference that is really so focused on that specific, a, a specific goal and specific field. And so I think there's a real argument for, you know, under the DEAI rubric, of um, why it's important to attend this conference. Uh, this is Charles again, and Jamie, I saw you were poised to speak. Yeah, this is Jamie again. I think one thing I would say to anyone thinking about this or trying to make the pitch is that for me personally, I know LEAD helped me in my general customer service ability for everyone attending our events, not only for people who had accessibility needs because everyone's an individual. And the question may be as simple as, you know, do you need a specific type of seat? And somebody says, yeah, I'm six five. I would love to be on an aisle. And that's not necessarily what we think of when we think about accessibility, but that's still just as much about helping someone to have a good and comfortable and meaningful experience at the event as anything else that you might learn. So I think really learning to think about your program from the perspective of the people coming to it and taking into account that customer service and that universal des design and inclusivity helps in all facets of your organization in ways that you don't even know when you first start and you start to pick those up and recognize them as you go through it. This is Charles again, and thank you so much, Jamie. That spectrum from customer service to social justice. And Tina. So I'm also thinking of it, uh, this is Tina, I'm thinking it also from the perspective of we didn't have lead last year. And our world has changed. And we have new technologies that are available now that we are using that we would not have thought about using two years ago when the pandemic started. Um, and we're better to understand how that integrates with cultural access then lead. Um, and then also talking about, you know, the importance I think of being proactive in, in terms of providing accommodations and accessibility and knowing what the latest and greatest technologies are. And I think that if you wanna get it all in one place at one time, this is the kind of conference that you're gonna get it at. So you're gonna get the most bang for your buck as opposed to like having to go to three or four different conferences to get kind of like piecemeal the different kinds of information. Um, you know, I love these conferences that are so specific to, a spe you know, like I'm an audiologist and I can go to audiology conferences, but when I have the one for educational audiologists, it's so concentrated and so powerful and so useful. That's how LEAD is for, I feel like cultural access. This is Charles again, and these are such great responses because all of them are apt, again, thinking about that proactive stance rather than being reactive. How many times are we always talking to cultural institutions about that very step to anticipate as opposed to merely react? I'm really happy that you added a good value, Tina, that, you know, uh, for, for the bargain hunters in us, um, new tech, is so invaluable because it's been two years since we've had the conference and there has been much that has changed. And we can gather on a Zoom, but to be in the physical space is so important, I believe. Jamie, you brought up customer service, which I think is so apt and so important in that broad perspective, rather than being designated customer service for this type of person or that type of person. And I wanna just sort of end with, and people might have other things they want to contribute on, you know, the convincing, the persuasion, but, you know, Annie, talking about the, the, the inclusion, 
diversity, equity, and access. You know, this is really built on social justice. I uh, mentioned in my first time visiting, it was a level of advocacy and uh, civil rights that just made complete sense to me. And this work that is being done around race and class and gender is obviously intrinsically tied to ability. So why lead? Back to our original question. Um, one of the things that uh, I have uh, come up with, and Tina, you mentioned this when we were meeting ahead of time, and I think we all know this, is the idea of the network of allies, or as Tina called them, and I love this, disruptors. Um, Betty has often called us access assets, which I think is super important. Allies talks about a little bit of that intersectional approach to really understanding what it means to be inclusive, the act of inclusion, um, but disruptors, the idea of changing. Do you wanna talk a little bit about disruption, Tina? So one of the things that I think that people with disabilities sometimes struggle with is asking for what they need. And it may be because they don't know what they need because they don't know what's available. And so when I think of like the disruptor model, I think that you know we're, we're seeing more and more people asking for accommodations that are kind of outside of the box and people may not have thought about before. I think people are being more vocal about asking for what they need. They're networking with other people and other people are kind of validating them and saying, you know what, you're right, this could be better. And so I think that in my mind, that's how I see kind of this momentum going right now. You know, I see people fighting tooth and nail for, for funding for their own organizations. And when, you know, we can collaborate and, and you know, use our voices together, I think that we can disrupt, um, you know, with the right kind of like critical mass. I'm sorry, I keep, you know, putting these buzzwords in there, but these are, you know, the things that I'm thinking about in my head. And this is Charles again. I think what's important, and, and Tina, I really mean this, these are actually more than buzzwords. And maybe that's one of the reasons why LEAD is as important as it is. We can hear the buzzwords, but how do we enact them to make them embodied in our practice. Yes, Annie. Sorry, finding my mute button. I can never remember that keyboard shortcut. Um, I would love to add to, to, to that sort of comment and your question, Charles, because I think one of the things that LEAD helps with is building a community. Um, I think sometimes, um, depending on where you work, depending on what your role is, if you're doing this work, it can feel very isolating. There are many, many people who are the only person in their department or in their institution or in their organization or even in their, in their, in their town who are focusing on accessibility, focusing on disability inclusion in the cultural sector. And it can feel uh, very exhausting and isolating and I think what happens is at LEAD is you sort of, here's another buzzword, you kind of find your tribe um, of, and what do you call it? Whether you feel like a disruptor or an asset or somebody who's just learning, who's an, act, an activist, an advocate, all of these words, you can find sort of people that you can connect with and learn from and LEAD in person in a physical space. Um, you, you will see it referred to as access summer camp because it does feel that way when you go and uh, you go back more than once and you reconnect with people who you met at the prior conference. But it, there's also what happens in between. You come home with a lot of energy, and uh, but the lead process doesn't just leave you 
to, you know, have that energy peter out. And by two months later, you're sort of back, you know, slogging through your, your job and feeling overwhelmed again, because you leave with connections, you leave with people who genuinely mean, hey, reach out to me, I'm doing the same thing. Maybe we can partner together. Maybe we can share with each other. Maybe we can form a group within our town. Maybe we can, you know, can reconnect with our affinity group um, of people who work in theaters or people who work in science museums or, um, you know, and there is, um, there is also the, um, Tina mentioned in her introduction, she mentioned the, uh, the lead listserv, which, uh, you know, I've been in this field for 10, 12 years, and I still use that listserv. Whenever I have a question I want to throw out to the field, you know, I throw it out to that listserv and I get responses. And so um, I think in many ways, it's that many voices kind of all wanting similar goals and all advocating for similar things in their own unique and special ways um, is that that to me is what makes it powerful and magic. Thank you so much. This is Charles again. And I'm just going to sort of keep pushing a little bit on this idea, because I do know that the, you know, the last two years, the, the great sheltering, so many people working remotely, a lot of changes in the air, a racial reckoning based on, uh, again, another murder of a black man at the hands of the police. So this is a moment that is ripe for change. And uh, I would say that uh, another reason to really be thinking about lead is to tie those threads together um, to really understand the, the systems that are oppressing and ways that we can enhance and encourage people to be involved. When, and we'll open up to questions uh, in our, our audience in, in a moment, but um, thinking about, again, your, your time at LEAD um, and you keep coming back, which is great. I am on that list. What has got you excited about LEAD this year? August 1 through 5, 2022, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yes, Jamie. I think one of the things I'm most excited about this year is just what you were talking about, is that people are starting to think and talk in different ways about diversity and inclusion and equity and what that really means. And so the opportunity to come back together with all of these people who are already engaged or excited or looking to get engaged and excited about how they do that work at their organizations and how do they bring accessibility into that picture as well and bring universal design into that picture as well. So that when we're thinking about and working on these other things, we're also building in, like you were saying earlier, that proactive piece that not just waiting for someone to say, hey, I need this, but actively thinking about and anticipating what might people need in order to remove barriers to be part of what it is that we're doing. And so I'm excited to get back in here and learn more what folks have been doing, what folks are looking forward to doing and learning more that I can bring back home. Yes, Annie. Sorry. <laughs> so I, I love that, uh, that you mentioned all of that, Jamie. And I, and I think, you know, as we're thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, access is kind of a fundamental requirement for before you can even talk about equity or inclusion. So that's one of the things that I think is really worth pointing out. I also want to talk for just a second about uh, being a presenter at LEAD. Um, I'll be presenting um, for the first time in a couple of years. Um, I, I, I have had years where I have presented a lot and I have years where I have ha not presented at all. And that experience of um, being able to connect with people, like again, being a presenter at LEAD, there are a number of different ways that you can contribute your voice. Um, 
both as an attendee and as a presenter, a number of different sessions, everything from the very short spotlight sessions to the you know day long capacity building workshops. There's a lot of variety there of opportunities both for participating and presenting. But even when you present, I often learn more as a presenter from sort of the panelists that I work with or the audience questions that I get than I would if I were sort of just sitting in the room. And so I'm excited to kind of be back on the uh, the speaking side of the microphone for the first time in a few years. Um, and I would encourage everybody, um, if this is your first time, you know, go with a mind to thinking about, okay, well, maybe if I come back next year, what can I contribute to this conversation? Because I think, again, that's what the strength is, is hearing from so many different people at different stages in their career with different um, perspectives. So. Thank you. Yes, Tina. I, I totally echo that, Annie. So um, I um, was fortunate, and when I first came, I was um, I co-presented with that same friend that invited me to come, and I learned so much. Just like you said, um, you know, we're we're kind of like a hive, right? You know, we talk about the listserv, and when we get together in person, we really are kind of a hive mind. And there's this organic process where we will be like, oh, I never thought of that, or oh, that's such a brilliant idea. I'm going to bring that back home. And yeah, the listserv has you know value for things like that. But when you know what it's like, you know, doing Zoom can only be so effective versus email being only so effective. But when you can get together in a room and have that instant back and forth, um, you know, bouncing of, of ideas off of each other, it's it's just so powerful. And so for me, I, I love learning and I also love teaching. So like what LEAD has done for me is it helped me to realize like I could take my skills that I have and help create resources and build that kind of collective knowledge. Um, and you know, there is such value in, in giving back to the community that way as well. This is Charleston, and thank you for saying that, Tina, because it is sort of coming back to something at the beginning that was mentioned, uh, whether it's the, the tribe, the network, the colleagues, but it's the generosity of exchange that I think is so important. We know that people come from different venues and different disciplines. Not every step may be relevant to every person, but the connections that we make that do continue after the conference, those quick phone calls that you can make, uh, those quick emails that you can make that do not require a back and forth, but a shorthand, that's what keeps us moving forward and also keeps our work fresh. Uh, Tina, you brought up the technology changes that have happened over the last couple of years, and keeping on top of that isn't easy, along with everything else that we're juggling. I want to be sure to give time for our audience to uh, ask uh, specific questions of the panelists, uh, whether you'd like to raise your uh, avatar hand or unmute or uh, put the question in the chat. I encourage you uh, to participate. As always with uh, colleagues from LEAD, it really is about this exchange of ideas and we have the generosity of our panelists um, ready to take your calls. Another piece that I've been thinking about, and this is really, uh, some of it is coming from the comments that I've heard uh, you make today. Um, about uh, the access that kind of is just integrated into the process so that your decision-making about what you might attend isn't going to be restricted by who has the description or who has the interpreter or the interpreters on lunch break or whatever those things that might be that become those barriers. Uh, do you remember a session that you attended that you had that aha moment when it was just like, ah, this is it? Yes, Dina. So when we met informally before, you know, the session today, I used that example of, you know, when, when I have interpreters that are assigned to me, as opposed to interpreters assigned for the conference, um, what I'm doing is I'm 
holding up my finger, licking it and, and throwing it to the wind, you know, kind of like indicating that I can just go wherever I want, just like another person that decides, you know what, I'm not really liking this session or I'm not learning that much from the session. I'm going to try a different one. I can't, I've never had the opportunity or like, like the realization that I could do that. And it was so liberating to me to know that 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 was a possibility. Um, and so for me, that that's an example of, you know, that kind of accessibility that was so that was so wonderful. And it also showed me that, you know what, I can ask for this at other conferences too. Like I never would have thought about that so much because I had never experienced it. So like that outside the box thinking, you know, instead of, you know, the interpreter, you know, just being for one in one place, it, it, it's so great. Thank you. Jamie, uh, Annie, uh, an aha moment. Annie, I see you're thinking. Um, yeah, no, I can, I can share. I mean, so many, so many opportunities, but in specific sessions that have often been really helpful to me have actually related sometimes to the law and um, we all, you know, I would say most of us would probably say that um, legal compliance is sort of not the best reason um, or the best, it can sometimes be a good motivator, but it's not necessarily the best reason to make things more accessible and inclusive. Um, it's much more, you know, there are much better reasons. It's the right thing to do, making accessibility the norm instead of the exception. I mean, there's so many other positive reasons, but it's really helpful to know the law and to learn it in an interesting way. And so from that capacity building workshop, that was the very first session I ever attended where I realized that the ADA was actually kind of fun um, to at the end of every lead, there is some version of um, the, the, the famous legal session where people can bring their questions. It is a session that is understood to be, um, you know, a sort of a, a cloak of anonymity and you can be very frank and ask questions of people who work for the access board or the or the um, regional office of the ada who are experts at not only their job but at communicating about their job and explaining um, changes in the law explaining adjustments because it's useful to know and understand legal ramifications even if that's not the thing that propels you or compels you to move forward so those have been some of my favorite sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. What are you thinking about, Jamie? Was there a moment or is it all the moments? I think it has been all of the moments. I mean, I love what Annie said just about the understanding the why. Like, why is this important? Whether or not you've done this before, because I think one of my pre-lead aha moments and why I even got interested in the first place was being at one of my organization's own events and seeing the house manager at the venue we were in, in his wheelchair with his neck craned up, looking at the person at the podium, trying to have a conversation. And that just struck me as such a, an easy thing to change by changing that podium to a table. And so then that kind of got me thinking and got me in conversations, which led to the, oh, well, this new group is starting with Universal Access in the Arts in Raleigh, and there's this conference all about accessibility in the arts. And maybe that will help answer some of the questions that I didn't even know I had, except for that one moment of why is this like this and how do we fix it? This is Charles again. I love that, Jamie, forming the questions you didn't even know you had. Uh, because I will say my aha moment at that first one was really in the ADA 101, because it just, again, unlocked this puzzle. But I will also mention that I think it was in Kentucky in 2011, but it might have been before that in 2010, I can't remember. I had gone to an ADA refresher because of the updates that were done. And literally after the session, ran out with my phone looking for whatever Wi-Fi. So I was like, needed to alert the staff back at the theater I was working at in Boston that wait on that website. 
<laughs> there are things we need to make sure we do. So uh, e even those moments are still uh, remembered because they were critically important and they facilitated appropriate change. Yes, Jamie. Sorry, you saying that made me think of one other one and it was a marketing discussion. Um, and now I'm gonna blank on the name of the woman from the Performing Arts Center in Denver. Um, Carol? Maybe in one of the folks in the background will remember Carol's last yeah, name. But yes, but in any case, yes, Carol Kruger. Thank you, Betty. Um, so I remember hearing her present and talk about, and it may have even been a lightning talk. It may not, it may have been just a short 15 minute session, but it was all focused on the communication before the event and how do people even know how to get to the venue or what are the steps that have to be taken and what can you tell people ahead of time so that they are prepared and know what to expect. And that was something that I knew I could do because I was already managing communications for my organization. So it was an easy first step, a starting place in front of all of this big, how do we make everything accessible to everyone? It was the, here's the first step to take. And then from there, you can start to learn more and build. I do love that that uh, story, Jamie, because I literally, it, it, I don't even remember if the session was an hour or two, but it was a click and a run, which is sometimes how I end the lead conference anyway, where my brain clicks and I want to run and get all the work done. Um, uh, I know, and again, invite anyone who is in the audience, if they've got questions for the panelists, you can put them in the chat. Um, but I also know that we've got uh, Betty in the background and, and thinking about wrapping this up, and this is for all the panelists, but we'll start with Betty Siegel. Um, you mentioned, Jamie, that know before you go. So, uh, Betty, what might people, should people expect for this year's conference? Oh, I would have to say that people can expect a lot of fun, number one, because our Raleigh partners and the entire Raleigh community is throwing everything they've got at this particular lead. They're so excited. So that's number one. Number two, yes, there will be a legal session again. <laughs> it seems to have come up as the most popular topic. <laughs> I love how we all applaud the legal session. That's great. That's great. We'll do our little legal dance and uh, try to make you all as excited about uh, the law as I am and obviously the people on this call. Um, so yeah, definitely there's going to be a, a, a rich, rich and very diverse set of sessions and presenters and new stuff and old stuff. So yeah, please come. And the more people that come, you are really what makes lead work. And so our, for our panelists uh, that know before you go, um, what would you like people in this audience and people listening to the recording to know before they come? Yes, Tina. So um, this is Tina. Be prepared to lose your voice or your arms are gonna be tired or your eyeballs are gonna be tired. Um, you will not sleep because you will not want to let go of the people that you are going to be communicating with. Um, another conference that I go to our, our saying is we'll sleep when we're dead. You know, there's going to be lots of like hanging out in the lobby and having drinks and having the most amazing discussions and networking and collaborations with people. Um, so be prepared to have an open heart, open mind. Um, there is no dumb question at this conference either. And so these people are experts. You know, we all fall on the spectrum of being, you know, like, not knowing a lot to knowing a whole lot, you know, we're all experts at one, you know, at something, right? And, you know, hopefully you will find that person that has the information that you need. Thank you, Tina. 
Jamie, Annie, thoughts on what people should know before they go? Yes, Jamie. Yeah, I'll say don't be afraid to introduce yourself to someone before or after a panel or at lunch. Um, I know one of the best connections that I made my first year was someone who I was sitting in a session with and I happened to hear her say that she was with a festival. And at the time she was the only other person I had heard who was working at a festival anywhere at that particular year's conference. So I caught her, I think like on the way to the bathroom and said, oh, here's my card. I would love to talk more with you because I would love to talk more about festival accessibility. And we ended up presenting together the following year. So there's, you know, it's not just the presenters who have the knowledge base, it's everybody who's there will have a knowledge base or be a resource, someone to ask questions and bounce ideas off of. And it's, it is, it's just such a generous and welcoming community, and it's really a pleasure to be part of it every year. This is Charles again, and I think it's worth repeating sort of the, the approach is yes and. Yes. Uh, Tina can stay up all night, she can go to every session, and she can sleep, she's got the big mug, she's going to go. But if you are unsure, you're, you're going to be your own expert. You can choose the pace that you want to participate in. The, the sessions are for a variety of folks. You don't need to be an expert, but you need to care. You need to want to learn. Um, and that's really the big thing is to step into this space eager to learn. And with an, I think someone mentioned this earlier, that open heart, because it is a generous crowd. People want to connect and want to make our, our work stronger by empowering each other. Annie. I would love to add something brutally practical. Um, uh, well, first, brutally practical point. Um, if you have business cards, bring lots of them and give them to everyone and try to make as many connections as you can just go through them as much as you can and um, business cards may or may are you know we can talk about how they're more or less accessible but many people will um, have way, preferred ways that they like to connect and in thinking about that I was also reminded and I, I'm assuming there'll be an app again this year question mark uh, if if there is an app um, if there is one that will um, enable, you know, they'll enable to make it as accessible to everybody as possible. We've got a and, yes in the chat, Annie. So. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. So there will be an app. I would say download it before you come. Take the opportunity to, if they offer sort of training sessions about how to use it, see if you can attend one or watch a video, um, because the app is actually a great way to connect with who is going to be at the conference. It's a great way to see all the sessions. It's a great way to find all the sessions. And even if you're not sort of super technically oriented, there are definitely options that will be a paper. There will you know, be other options for how you can get information. But if you are at all so inclined, I highly recommend that experience. And I highly recommend familiarizing yourself with it ahead of time, um, because that will, it, it can be a tremendous asset um, if, if you embrace it. So This is Charles again. And that is such a great practical point, Ali, because I, uh, uh, Annie, I agree. The, <clears throat> the app allowed me to gather other people from Massachusetts so that we could have a little confab at the conference because I could see who else was there. And, you know, not being as shy as I, perhaps I pretend to be, I just reached out, you know, to everyone, you know, come gather. Um, but I will also say I did like the printed uh, book that allowed me to color while I was uh, in the sessions. And that's just because I like coloring. So again, another yes and answer. This is Leland McKeithen from South Arts. Can I ask a question, Charles? Oh, please. Hey, um, I was actually I probably distracted Annie because I didn't realize, but we went to school together when we were tiny, tiny children. So it's and nice we to have see. the same birthday. That's right, we do. <laughs> So it's a Hi, small, world. a very <laughs> high, sweetie. It's a small world. Um, I've worked at South Arts, one of the regional arts organizations for um, 
11 years or so, but just new to the uh, accessibility coordinating role. I'm curious, um, you may have already been over this and my apologies if you have, what's the average attendance? Um, just curious. And, and also is there uh, like a footprint or a structure for the conference? I believe there are workshops the first couple of days, some special workshops. It's not, it's not five days of the same thing. So what is the um, sort of general flow or do we not know yet? And that's acceptable too. Uh, this is Charles, and there may be people in the, the background of Zoom who know better, but <clears throat> from my experience, the, the two days, uh, I guess this would be August 1 and 2, uh, longer, uh, more deeper pre-conference, either full days or half days. Um, so that is a deeper study, a deeper investigation. Uh, and then the three days of the conference, there are sessions throughout the day happening concurrently, but generally with enough variety that if you can't do something at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, you'll see something similar offered uh, 3 p.m. on a Wednesday. Uh, again, those dates are totally made up, so don't be looking at the schedule, looking for Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. But as far as attendance goes, that would be a number that somebody in the background would have. Three hundred, three thousand. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of what I'm curious between the two. Six hundred in two thousand nineteen. Awesome. Yeah, I can oh, okay. I can say yeah. In Denver, we had about six hundred people. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Fantastic. And so happy that you and Annie are making the connection on the Zoom. See, Zoom has its perks. It's the technology that Tina was talking about earlier. Uh, we've all become so much more familiar with it. Well, I know we just have a few more moments together before this uh, call ends. Again, encouraging anyone who's got a one minute question that might have a one minute answer, we've got the time. Uh, but I do want to uh, thank Tina and Jamie and Annie for your, your time today, uh, your history with LEAD and your future with LEAD. Um, thanks to our captioner and to Sharon who has been interpreting and all of you who have joined this call thinking about LEAD and we hope uh, making that step to attend the LEAD conference, which as noted will be August 1 through 5 in Raleigh, North Carolina, where Jamie will be greeting each and every one of us. Well, and on that note, at 329, I want to thank everyone for being in this space. Obviously, follow up with questions that you may have, and a recording of this will be going out, and we hope to see you in Raleigh in August. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>